Hi, Glenn Crowder here. Thank you very much for listening to Head for the Hills, all brought to you by our good friends at eWool. They have a product that nobody else, believe me. And we're going to do local stuff and destination this entire season. We are so looking forward to it, and I'm so looking forward to talking to you over the next five months. Thanks for listening. Enjoy the show. An original from Story Studio Network. Well, here we go. Another episode of Head for the Hills. Dave Trafford here with Glenn Crowder. And, uh, yeah, winter has hit. I mean, I guess it was, Glenn, what was it? About middle of November? And that storm blew through and buried Buffalo. Yeah. Kind of reminded us, okay, well, shit happens when winter comes. Yeah, isn't uh, that the but truth? The, but, you know, we're starting to feel that right across. I mean, the, the Colorado lows that are bringing uh, snow and uh, so on to this part of the world. Um, and we've been talking to some of the resort owners and folks who are looking forward to, uh, you know, having a first full season under their belt as opposed to lockdowns and so on. And we keep talking about that. But there's just this general sigh of relief that comes with seeing the snow and people being able to get back out at the resorts. No question, Dave. And uh, I just came back from Quebec, uh, right from the Laurentians at Mont Tremblant, uh, over to uh, Saint Sever near Montreal, and then over to uh, Mount Sutton in the Eastern Townships. And they need snow as well. So it's not just a Toronto or an Ontario thing. Um, this weekend, I've just got a call from uh, Kevin Nickel from uh, the Ontario Ski Resort so Snow Resort Association mentioning that Boulder Mountain is going to be open this weekend. That's the one in London. We talked about that mm-hmm. magnificent snowmaking. That place is going to be open this weekend, along with Horseshoe Valley in Barrie, uh, Blue Mountain up in Collingwood, and they'll all join Mount St. Louis Moonstone, who's been open for three weeks because of their magnificent snowmaking. So there's no question that uh, the eastern eastern part of Canada certainly needs some snow, and they're talking about some good snow coming up in Ontario, so it works out perfect. Yeah, and, and and I think that's just sort of one of the things that people are keeping an eye and an, and an ear on. Um, it's it's funny. Uh, on the one hand, we'll hear people bitching and moaning about the snow coming, and on the other hand, <laughs> they're all excited about the snow coming. So uh, we'll, we'll get her done. One of the biggest questions I had this week, though, from uh, a listener who dropped into a first uh, episode, actually, of uh, Head for the Hills this season, and um, she said to me, you know, we used to listen to the radio in Toronto, and there was a guy on the radio, and his name was Wally Crowder. <laughs> I said, yeah, yeah, I remember Wally. He says, I, you know, I heard that ski show thing you do, and I just wondered, is, is Glenn any relation to Wally? And I said, yeah, he might be. <laughs> <laughs> Down the food chain. That, uh, dear old dad passed away about six years ago, but uh, he's still with us in heart, I guess. Yeah, indeed, and uh, and it's it's funny how uh, th- those are the memories that kind of come to uh, come to light when we start talking about that. So yes, indeed, uh, the uh, the apple didn't fall far from the tree here. Glenn Crowder here, and we're uh, getting into the uh, whole question of new gear. I know we've been talking about resorts, and we're kind of sprinkling in some of the the new technology, the new gear that's out there. So a lot of it has to do with safety. A lot of it has to do with comfort. And part of that comfort comes from our friends at eWool, who are uh, you know good enough to step up and sponsor the show. And uh, that, to me, is a huge breakthrough. I know we're going to talk about you know all the other gear that goes along with it, but you know what? Making it that much more comfortable when you're out in the cold and the blowing snow... You got me right there. A hundred percent. And again, I used it this weekend. I tried the uh, the socks. Now, they're a little different. I have to admit, they're fantastic, and they keep your feet warm. They're, they, they call them overlays. So what you do is you have your ski sock on, and then you put the heated sock, which has an empty, like a, 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 how can I say this? The heel is taken away. So right. basically, you just slide this over top of your sock, and it keeps you super warm. Because we had a couple cool days in Quebec, minus 10, minus 11 for the early going. So uh, there's no question about it. But I'll tell you what, my head boots, uh, you don't really need it. We're going to bring on Chris uh, Vandernock shortly to talk about head and, and all the equipment that's coming up. But Ewall has some, like really their products are just above and beyond. When I go into the chalet and I take my jacket off, people go, where'd you get that vest? What is that vest? And they see the little red light. Uh, they know that it's a heated vest. So yeah, they've got the, the top product right across the boards. Yep, Glenn is wired when he gets off the slopes. There you go. <laughs> uh, yeah, so you want to check out their product, ewool.com. Well, I know 
know, you and I were talking a little while ago just about the, the advancements in technology and trying to keep up with all the, uh, you know, the, the way that gear has developed to make things lighter, easier to manage on, you know, when you're out in the slopes, etc. cetera. Um, whether, you know, it's cross-country skiing or downhill, it, there's part of it that makes it more comfortable. But the thing that strikes me about more of it is it does two things. It makes it easier to learn. And the second part is it's a, there's a whole lot more safety built in to the gear, um, you know. And I, I, I know we're going to talk to the folks here at uh, Chris uh, from from uh, ahead, and and that to me seems to be, if I'm you know reading that right, what drives innovation right now in in the certainly in the ski industry. Well, there's no question, and Chris can address this for sure because we have so many new Canadians coming out that may not really know how to ski. Um, and also some high performance skiers that really take advantage of this. And I want to bring on Chris Vandernock, Vice President of Winter Sports for Head Canada. Chris, thank you very much for joining us and really appreciate it. And right off the bat, Head has really come out with some outstanding equipment this year. Seems to be the leader of the industry for sure. Uh, well, thanks for the kind words. We, uh, we like to think so. Um, yeah, you know, you guys, you guys touched on it, uh, you know, just quickly. There's a lot of new Canadians coming out uh, skiing, which is exciting to see. And there's a there's a lot of uh, opportunity for education that we need to do as an industry to get people out there. So, you know, listening to you guys talk about new products and places to go. And this is a great way to to get into everything and to learn how to how to get out there and and what you need to get out. So, um, yeah, we're we're pretty excited for for some new products that we're coming out for this year and and definitely uh, some things that are more safety driven. Uh, we, We tend not to talk too much about safety in skiing because it sometimes it might scare somebody. But uh, I mean, it's a reality of the sport. And, you know, we look at it the other way going, what can we do to, to mitigate this so we can go out there and, and enjoy this ama- amazing pastime and and spend the time in the great outdoors and be able to travel to Quebec and uh, and uh, enjoy everything that's going on over there. And Chris, we're going to talk a minute about the average person just walking in and what they should look for, how they should measure up the skis and things. But I just want to on that note of safety. Tell us about your brand new protector binding. It's a game changer. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, the, the the new protector binding, which uh, which we're coming out with this year, um, the the big difference in bindings or what bindings really used to do is bindings only protect anything that's in a ski boot that's locked into a binding. Uh, between all of us, that's that's not a lot. It's your ankle and your foot, and and even there, bindings have a limit of what they can do. So they are set up for your height, your weight, your age your ability level, and that is a release that we're going to either keep you in the binding or out of the binding. But there are situations where during certain falls um, and, and the activity of skiing where, where it, incidences can come up. And uh, the bindings of today really aren't delivering all the protection that they can. So uh, we've come up with a new binding that has a basically um, more release in the heel of a binding. The majority of the, of the release comes out of a toe piece, so if you're falling backwards, the boot is easy to come out of the binding, but a lot of people go forwards or they're sitting back and they and they get twisted around. And then that puts the knee in a, in a very interesting or problematic position. And what we've been able to do with this binding is now we're actually able to make this binding not only release vertically, but also release laterally in either direction. So if you do have a fall where you're sitting back, your waist goes behind your knees, and we're putting this undue stress on our knees, the ability of this binding is it will allow you to slide out laterally if you need it. If you don't need it, it's going to laterally keep you back in. So with this binding, we can reduce the risk of knee injuries by up to 50%. And wow. that's, it, that's a pretty big number. That's a significant number for sure. Um, that means I'll only rip up one knee as opposed to both <laughs> knees. So <if> we just... <laughs> yeah, one knee's better than both knees, but no, the goal is uh, we don't want any knees. Uh, this, this coming from a guy who's sitting in the studio. <laughs> Tough to fall off that chair and pop out of the binding. That's, that's right. uh, also, Chris, just want to mention the fact that for this binding, do you have to have any particular weight, any particular style, uh, any particular level of skiing, or is it for everyone? And you know, it's, uh, it is it is a binding for everyone. Right now, as we're launching it out, it is, it is being launched at a, a more of a mid to high level aspect. Um, but this is during the launch of it, trying to get people a customized, easy to talk about the technology uh, and go from there. 
you know, the sneak peek coming out in the next year or two, you're going to start seeing this across all facets of our, of our line. Uh, but it really is a technology that anyone can benefit. If you have knees, you can benefit from this. Uh, there are, there are different ways to, to address this binding. Every binding is set up what we call a DIN number. So your height, your weight, your age, we put this into a matrix and come out with a number and we set that number in the toe piece and the heel piece. Well, we have a third area laterally, which we can adjust this to. So the binding is perfectly set up for each individual skier. So if you're a beginner skier and your DIN is low, the binding is set up perfectly for you at that level. If you're a performance skier, your DIN is going to be a little bit higher. The binding is now set up for that. And we're not sacrificing any performance. We're gaining safety. And that so how often do you have to have that? adjustment made i mean i'm assuming you'd, you'd want to do it at least every season but i can see where you've got young kids for example or teenagers all of a sudden there's a growth spurt that's gonna play into it right yeah as, as uh, if if uh, for us if we're not changing too much the heights aren't changing anymore uh weights might fluctuate a little bit uh that would be the only time you're really changing the din or getting your, your skis adjusted at that point uh, but it's usually done once a year or once it's set up properly. Uh, if it is going into children and as they're growing or, or, or youth as they get bigger, yes, we'll, we'll adjust as you go. And, and any major changes in, in height, weight or boot size or skier type will need to be adjusted. But it's usually it's set it and forget it and then you don't have to worry about it anymore. All we, all we want you to do and you touched on is is go have fun. Right. Mm -hmm. We want to make, mm -hmm. you know, the, the products out here right now are designed to be lighter uh, to be safer and, and everything out there, we want to keep you skiing, right? Whatever, if it's lighter, you're less fatigued, you ski longer, you're, you're safer. You know, we have goggles with, with more high cost, uh, high contrast in the lenses, less fatiguing of the eyes, better color clarity and definition. So you can see all the issues ahead of you. You're safer. Um, skis are much lighter. So even carrying them to and from the, from the car, you're less fatigued, you're skiing longer, boots are more comfortable. I mean, Glenn talked about his boots. Thank goodness they're good. Uh, you know, they, they are more comfortable. Uh, they flex easier. Some of them are lighter. Again, less fatiguing, ski longer, more enjoyment. Chris, the most important part, I think you hit a note there, is the fact is that people should take their bindings. And I've, I stress this each and every year. Take your bindings to a pro shop right off the bat at the beginning of the year. There's probably a little bit of tightness after the winter sitting around, after the all sorts of things that can happen to bindings. As well as, I was, it was pretty funny because Jeff Salter from Sporting Life, I took my skis and bindings to him. It was like a brand new car coming out of the line when they, everybody saw the, this binding because he said all the technicians ran to the back as he installed the, uh, the binding. So this truly is a game changer and it's getting a lot of attention so congratulations on that as for the binding that's tremendous but how about the skis i'm really confused because in the old days we used to measure our skis the bottom of our of our hand i think those days i'm hoping are over because my son is six seven so he'd have to put put down a, a tree if he's going to go <laughs> ski so i think that that may have changed if that uh, if that's correct yes uh we've we've evolved this a lot more it, it's interesting before with the skis were much narrower we needed the length of the, of the ski to be stable because we, we and we needed the width of the ski for the agility. So we all skied, you know, feet close together. We bend the knees, uh, $20, please, as we ski down and we woggle our, our butts down the ski hills. <laughs> well, with the with the advantage of shape skis and wider skis, our, our stance now gets a little wider and our skis get shorter. So now our stance becomes the agility and the balance that we want. And the length of the ski is more the, the turning ability. So if we go to a little longer ski, we're usually skiing a little higher speeds, a little bit larger turns, and we can go shorter skis, a little bit quicker turning. So this is a great advancement, particularly in Ontario or Quebec, where the hills are a little shorter. We're not skiing skis that are two meter 10, or we're skiing skis that are 170 centimeters, 170 centimeters. So easier to use, you know, the, the, the tip of the ski is right there. So it reacts so much quicker. Your positivity, your reaction from the skis is, is amplified. Uh, it, they're way more fun. So yes, skis are much, much shorter, uh, more based on your weight, uh, your weight rather than your uh, height. Are they going to get much wider? I think we maxed out. We, there was, there was a, a few years ago where you're seeing some, some skis getting up to 125, 128 underfoot millimeters. This is massive. Like that, that you basically could take them water skiing, uh, and some people <laughs> did. Uh, we, we've, we've brushed this, brought this down a little bit more and we max out at a 117 underfoot, which 
is a pro model ski. I mean, if you're in a helicopter, that's the ski you want to be in. Yeah. Uh, for the rest of us mere mortals, we're finding that the average is between, let's say, 70 millimeters to 100 millimeters. And in, in that range there, you're, you're basically playing the difference between more of a sports car when we go a little narrower or more of an SUV where we're going a little wider. So it handles more snow conditions a little bit easier. So in the east, we're, we're playing around with a little bit narrower waist. And in the west, where they have the, the much deeper snow and the larger hills, uh, they're definitely playing in the wider footprints. Chris, when I take a look at skiing, I talk to an awful lot of people. And uh, the number one concern for a lot of people, the skis are fantastic. When, again, go to a pro shop, get fitted up properly. But the boots are the point that really can make or break your day. And my, when I put on the heads that, um, that I was fortunate enough to have, I put them on instantly and never had a problem. And I ski all the time. And I really think that the advancement, especially with the head, for the comfort of the boots has really advanced. It's, it's uh, you know... 100% the boot is the most important aspect in, in the skiing you can go. I mean, we can talk about the safety of the bindings, which is, is, is very, very important. But if your boots don't fit, you're not in your skis. So the bindings don't matter. The boots have to fit, particularly if you're going anywhere, you know, kind of a drive. Figure if you're, if you're driving from Toronto and you're going out to Quebec and your boots don't work, you're sitting in the chalet, everything's wasted. So boots 100% are the most important uh, piece of equipment we can buy. And the evolution of boots is that they're more anatomically correct off the bat. So the internal shape, we work a lot, uh, a lot of hours on to make sure that when you slide that foot in, the foot sits flat. It's a, it's a very positive experience out of the box. If it doesn't work, and, and some people have that ability, just pop on a boot, foot works, no problem. I, on the other hand, have a very high end step, a little wider forefoot. I need a little more love and, and nurturing to get into my boots. Uh, so we work with specific plastics that are easy to uh, to mold uh, very, very quickly. Obviously, you go into a store, uh, there's professional people who can um, fit your boots for you and, and really and make the make them sing to your individual foot. Um, but we really, really spend a lot of time on the quality of the liners. So the one unique thing about our boots is our liner, um, we actually want you to heat mold it. We want you to put that whole boot in, into, an, into a specific oven warm up the boot and activate this liner. And the neat thing about our liner is the foam will actually expand where it needs to expand and compress where it needs to compress. So not only are we trying to build a boot for a generic person to fit into, we can now take this generic boot and quickly, quickly personalize it to your specific foot. Because between your left and right feet, I guarantee there's one toe that's a little bit longer that you wish you didn't have. There's a, you know, a big toe that's sitting out on a wonky angle or a higher instep. These nuances can be easily adapted by putting the boot in an oven. And with this liner, it just it molds and adapts. And on some models, we actually do another uh, ability where you can actually inject um, a silicone based material in there to even personalize that fit even more. So if you have a narrow Achilles region or some wonkiness around the back of your foot and we need the better uh, heel hold, we can actually inject material in there and, and amplify that fit. If it doesn't work, we can also take material out of that area. So the amount of customization now with boots is pretty impressive. And the, gone are the days where you're putting on a boot and going, oh, my God, my, my feet are killing. Boots fit great. And we have specific lasts or different models, depending on the level of skier that you're going to be in, width of foot, volume of foot. So we can really fit uh, the majority of feet that are out there. We're speaking with Chris Vandernock, Vice President of uh Winter Sports for Head Canada. Just very quickly as we wind up, I just want to make a point. Um, what really confuses me sometimes is the is the buckle that goes, we call it the, I guess you call it the overlap strap. Um, you know what I'm talking about? And I see a lot of people come out of a cold car. They can't get their boots on. Their boots won't move. They're like a frozen icicle. And I'm telling people, just let you, you can't, you need to have your boots warm before you put them on. Take them in the chalet, let them warm up. But also if you want to do, and again, f forgive me on the, I'm, I'm talking about the strap that goes across the top. You've got a double, which it makes it even easier. I always do that up first and then the rest of the buckles make it easier. Yeah, for, for sure. I mean, well, I, I, Glenn, I should tell you that we do actually have a heated ski bag, a ski boot bag uh, that you can plug in and, uh, and wow. actually preheat your boots. So in your car, your boots are always toasty, so we don't run into that problem. Uh, but yes, boots should be a, a little bit warmer. It helps get on. But yeah, that, that upper strap and the upper buckles, you, you, you want to make sure all the buckles are, are, are open and unlatched and give them a twist. And when you're doing up your boots, the, the doing up the top buckles first, 
to pull your foot into the back of the heel pocket is your best chance of success for the rest of the day. And then it allows the foot to settle back in there. You also have to be, you know, if you're putting boots on in the morning, you want to you want to give yourself a couple minutes to allow the feet to get into the boots in the first thing in the morning. There's a lot of blood in your feet. First thing in the morning, we need that blood pumping around, getting out of your feet into the rest of your body. So a couple of minutes, you know, five minutes into your boots after they're buckled up and walking around, you're going to find that boots fit much more comfortably. Uh, and, you know, some pressure points or some pins and needles go away because you're getting that blood pumping through the rest of your body. Good stuff. I think this is fantastic, Chris, and wanted to really thank you very much for everything. And and we really need to talk about that warm boot bag. That's a pretty good idea because I put my I throw my stuff in the very back of the SUV, and it's a little cool sometimes. And I always go to the chalet and let them warm up for about five minutes. But I'd love to get on the ski slopes as soon as I can. Uh, th- this th- this definitely helps. So do you, do, you, do you plug that into the adapter in the car? Is that how you do it, or is it just running yes. on a battery itself? Yeah, uh, you just plug it into the car adapter. Yeah. Cool. Wow, what a great idea. Chris yeah. Vandernock, want to thank you very much. Uh, really appreciate your help. The equipment is fantastic. I get more and more people knock on my back, saying, "Where'd you get those? Where'd you get those boots? Where'd you get those skis? They look like they they really perform." As I've mentioned in Quebec, I've skied in some powder, I've skied in some ice, and my goodness, that ski performs like with a combination of a boot like I've never seen before. Excellent, great, to, great to hear it. We're uh, well, yeah, happy to hear. It. Thank you. Yeah, good Thanks stuff. for joining us, Chris. We appreciate it. Thank you, guys. My pleasure. Okay, so lots on the agenda. We're talking gear. We're talking resorts. We should also let people know that uh, in the next little while you're heading uh, to Europe, so you're going to be able to kind of you know talk about some of the rock stars that uh, are uh, you know populating the World Cup circuit, etc. And the coolest thing is um, the idea that um, Mount uh, what is it um, Mount Tremblant Mount Tremblant. is talking about the possibility of hosting a world cup event next season. So it's going to be kind of a cool thing to watch. So I'm anxious to hear what happens there when you get to Europe. Yeah, we'll be evolving and I'll be in Quebec city just to let you know in January, mid January. Then I come back and I go to Austria uh, with uh, my, our buddy, Mike Marzison uh, from TSN. We're going to go for 10 days to, uh, to Austrian ski. Then I come back for three days and then I head to uh, Fernie and Panorama. So uh, over the next month and a half, we've got a lot of traveling, then hopefully to Utah after that. So lots of places we're going to come to you live from different resorts and really bring the world of skiing to you. And people like Chris Vandernock from Vice President of Head uh, Canada um, and Winter Sports has really, they've, they've evolved into a point where we're making skiing that much more fun and people are catching on real quick. It's, it's pretty cool to see out in the slopes. Well, looking forward to uh, all that coming up in the, in the next number of weeks. Glenn, always good to talk to you. Chat next week. Thank you, Dave. Our technical producer and audio editor for Head for the Hills is Mike Trutler. Our production manager is Jamie Nickerson. Our executive producer is Aaron Trafford. And our sonic logo designer is Greg McDonald. I'm Dave Trafford. Thanks for listening. This is SSN.